You're listening to Podcateers. Welcome to episode 287 of Podcateers. In this episode, we recap many of the changes that we saw come across the Disneyland Resort throughout 2019, and we also recap the D23 Expo. The internet loses it with a Baby Yoda changing sign, and Gavin introduces us to what may be our newest collection obsession. Also, we're in the process of planning our schedule for 2020, and we'd love your help in deciding what to cover over the next 12 months. So please join the conversation by sharing your thoughts over on Instagram, Facebook, or on Twitter. Just search for Podcateers. Uh, This holiday season, if you're making any purchases on Amazon, a great way to support the podcast is by using our Amazon link the next time you make a purchase by first going to podcateers.com slash Amazon. There you'll find a big Amazon button that'll take you to Amazon when you click on it, and Amazon will give us a small commission from your purchase as a thank you for mentioning them on the podcast. No need to do anything else. It's not going to cost you anything extra, but we do get a little bit of extra help from Amazon because you went through a couple of extra clicks. It's that simple. So to everyone out there already using our link, we appreciate it because it certainly helps us out. But if you like what we do, the best way to help us out is by becoming part of a special group of folks called the FGP Squad, aka our podcast, Fairy Godparents, because it's their monthly support via Patreon that help make these episodes of Podcateers possible. If you want to be part of that elite crew, you can find out more info on how to sign up by going to podcateers.com slash FGP. To all of the members of the FGP squad, we appreciate you and thank you for all of your continued support. All right. Y'all ready to do this? Good. I am too. So let's get it started. Here is episode 287 of Podcateers. How's your mornings going? So far, so good. Nice. Well, as you can tell, it is a coffee creamer day for me. Oh, Um. that means lots of (laughs) coffee for Hazen. Yep. There's a lot of stuff (laughs) going on. There's a lot of changes that are coming uh, in our personal lives. You know, there's a lot of adjustments that we're making. So uh, I need that energy coursing through my system. Vitamin caffeine needs to be... (laughs) in full effect today i should make a t-shirt that says vitamin caffeine caffeine, or something yeah that'd be funny Mm -hmm. uh so yeah i kind of want to jump into our topics for this week as soon as possible because there's a lot of stuff to cover that happened in 2019 Mm -hmm. so every month we've tried to concentrate on a new land an attraction the history and the fourth episode of the month was always armchair imagineering where we kind of discuss what we would like to see what we would build in its place etc uh if you want to check out all of the armchair imagineering episodes the best way to do that is to go to podcateers.com up in the menu you'll see uh, a menu option for armchair imagineering that's the best way to see uh to see a listing of all of the ones that we've done throughout the year there's also one for all of the people that we've had a chance to talk to so a chat with is the way that you'll see that and of course all of the other episodes are available there uh but this month we've been concentrating on just kind of aggregating our thoughts on some of the things that have happened as far as new uh we talked about animated movies a couple weeks ago we talked about live action films this week we're going to be talking about disneyland resort updates events and the d23 expo and some of the most memorable things some of the changes uh but before we do that i want to let you know that we really value the feedback that you give us about the podcast and so You know, we do this for fun. We do this because we enjoy doing it. But at the same time, we want you to enjoy it as well. So going into 2020, we'd like to hear from you what you want us to cover. So you can leave a comment and join the conversation over on Instagram, Facebook, or on Twitter. Just search for Podcateers. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the things that you want us to cover and talk about in 2020. We'll also be mixing in some of our stuff. So uh, leave your thoughts and we'll, we'll try to incorporate as many of those as possible uh, into our upcoming 2020 schedule. 
Um, before we get started, <laughs> I got to send a quick shout out to our buddy, Sam, Sam Carter. <laughs> Been on the podcast before. He's at Cartar Sauce, C A R T A R Sauce on Twitter because, oh, he duped the internet yet again. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> right? Right. That's kind of how I feel about this. So last week, there was this image floating around because Sam tweeted, um, guys, why is nobody talking about this Baby Yoda changing station at Galaxy's Edge? And there was, uh, you know, how baby changing stations and restrooms have, like, the little person, like, a male, female baby changing stations have, like, that little baby just kind of floating there. And this one seemed to have a little baby Yoda. And with the popularity of baby Yoda from The Mandalorian, the internet kind of exploded where news media outlets were picking up this image, calling Disneyland to confirm if that was a legit thing. It wasn't. It was just Sam <laughs> being Sam again. Uh, this is not the first time that something like this has happened. Years ago, Sam was also behind a very popular internet rumor that Mary Poppins was going to be redone by Tim Burton when he created a Poppins poster mm -hmm. in a very Tim Burton-looking style. Um, thoughts on, on duping the internet? Brilliant. Yeah, well done. <laughs> Brilliant. Well done. Uh, oh, man. They should have called the movie Sam Breaks the Internet, not Ralph. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 he's a very talented man. Like, I, I love what he does. I love his uh, work in general. And he's also extremely clever. And not everybody could pull this kind of thing off. And just like slide it out to the world casually, like, uh, why, why are people yeah. talking about this? You know, like it's yeah. no big deal. And I don't know. I would overthink it, and I would, I would have a, a caption that wouldn't work or something. You know, like he, it was, it's, it was just perfectly done. I'm super guilty of the same thing, by the way. <laughs> 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 what most people say in ten words, I tend to say in six hundred. Right. Yeah, I'm the same. It was like you said. I think what made it so clever was the fact that he did just slip it out right mm -hmm. just like the poppins one so yeah well done sir I, I i didn't even know what to say because when i first saw it i tweeted it and i remember walking around galaxy's edge and going to the restrooms and i remember looking at all of the details and thinking to myself i don't ever remember seeing this sign before <laughs> and so i thought well maybe it was added and mm -hmm. And, and then when I realized that it was a tweet from Sam and not necessarily a retweet from Sam, I thought, wait a second. Is this even real? <laughs> 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 so I sent him a message uh, and, and he confirmed that, yes, it was not real. <laughs> That's hilarious. So, yeah, it was. Uh, you got to be careful on the Internet, man. You just never know. Uh, we we tend to take Wikipedia as gospel sometimes, and that is not the case. You know, the internet is full of memes, and I won't call them lies. We'll call them fiblets of of truth. Fiblets, <laughs> fiblets like of that. truth. Fake news fiblets. <laughs> yes, fake news fiblets. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you, you just can't always believe everything that you see. And I think this was a really great exercise in in just kind of double checking everything that you see, right? Not, mm -hmm. I, I ended up retweeting it, uh, but I tend to retweet a lot of the cool stuff that Sam creates and posts anyway. So um, I think initially it kind of duped me because I had to second guess myself several times. And it wasn't until I realized like, man, this could be something he made up. And I texted him that I was like, "Nah, eh, I already retweeted <laughs> it. I'm just going to leave it. I mean, there's, there's no going back yeah. now. I, I think that's fine. <laughs> um, oh, I, I had a small Team Boat Willie story to to kind of share for you. Uh, oh. I was going to try to share this on Instagram, and I, I, I guess I was just going to do a screenshot or something. But <clears throat> it's just one of those touching stories where you kind of think to yourself, man, humanity needs more of this, right? 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't remember all the details because I kind of glanced through it. But I'll put more information in the blog post for the episode. But the TLDR of the story is that there was these two competing coffee shops. Um, and the first coffee shop was owned by a husband and wife. The second one was owned by a lady. Uh, her first name is Pixie. I don't remember what her last name is. But uh, Pixie started her coffee shop shortly after she beat her battle with cancer. And uh, she kind of ran the coffee shop about a year or so. And then uh, the owner, Dave, of the other competing shop that he ran with his wife was also diagnosed with cancer. And so he started going through all sorts of therapies and, you know, going to get treatment. And uh, the, the, his wife wanted to spend more time with him as he was going through these treatments. And, uh, you know, it's logical, right? So what Pixie did was she closed her coffee shop, just straight up closed her coffee shop to go run their coffee shop and all proceeds for all the sales, donations, and basically all money that was coming into the shop was being funneled over to support Dave's fight with cancer. Wow. And for one business owner, right? For like one business owner to do that for another and i I don't i don't remember reading that they knew each other she just knew of them but found out because you know they're they're coffee shops you know you kind Mm -hmm. of have same suppliers and all that stuff but i just thought it was such a touching story it was it's one of those that when it happens in the holidays it reminds you of you know, how warm and touching the holidays can be when people step out of their comfort zone and do something nice for somebody else. But I mean, I I think we can do stuff like that more often. It doesn't have to be in the holiday seasons. Right. right. So I think there was a trending hashtag, like be like Pixie. Uh, uh, one of Dave's uh, sayings was he had his own hashtag that was like loved deeply, which is the way that that he signed off some videos that he used to make about his coffee and everything like that. So uh, I think there was a GoFundMe started. I I don't know if it's still open, but I think the GoFundMe ended up raising over $12,000 wow. to help support uh, his, his cancer treatment efforts. Very cool. And I mean, it, it's, it's an amazing story. Uh, I love reading stuff like that. You know, we've talked about it before that on a constant basis, we're always bombarded by all these horrible stories and, you know, negativity in the world. And this is just an instance where it, it warms your heart. At least yeah. that's how I feel. Yeah, definitely. Where where was this? Oak Grove, Oregon. Oh, cool. Yeah. The, the owner... Oh, here. I, I found the article. So Pixie Adams was the owner of Moonlight Coffee House. And Dave McAdams was the gentleman, Dave and Tina are the husband and wife team that ran the local coffee company. That's what it, that's what the coffee shop is called. And so as part of the efforts, uh, Pixie had created uh, something called the Moonlight Takeover Fundraiser. So basically Moonlight Coffee took over the other coffee shop and did this major fundraiser hmm. for Dave. So it's really cool. Um, yeah, I, I'm telling you, it, it's just amazing. How, how people can just step up and just do something nice for somebody right. else without expecting anything in return. And, you know, th- those are model citizens that I think more of us can can really try to emulate. Oh, heck yeah. 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 So. And especially like as, you know, if you have your business right now is like the time where you're everyone's competing for that right. dollar. Right. So for them to close their shop down and help out their competitor is huge. Mm-hmm. That's just it's a beautiful story and a lesson. I mean, I love it. Yeah. I think uh, a big reason why she, she, she talked about it in the article. Uh, She Mm -hmm. had mentioned, I think to CNN that part of the reason she did it was because she remembers her battle with cancer and how difficult it was and the journey and, you know, how, how much, how expensive it was and everything. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we see this a lot, I think in certain communities when people have the same type of, of, you know, treatments that they have to go through and there's a big support system. But I mean, this I feel is above and beyond. 
Yeah. Absolutely. You know, so the, what was the award that we created that, that we haven't given out in a while? Uh, what did we call it? The Podcateers Hero of the Week or something like that? Yes. Yeah, the Hero of the yes. Week. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if we can award the Hero of the Week award to anybody, it definitely has to be to Pixie Adams for this amazing gesture for Dave and his wife, Tina. 100%. Okay. So I think it's time for us to jump into Disneyland Resort updates, events, and the D23 Expo. But before we do that, I do want to remind you that this episode of Podcateers is brought to you by a fantastic group of people known as the FGP Squad. What is the FGP Squad, you ask? I'm so glad that you asked. The (laughs) FGP Squad stands for Fairy Godparents, and they are, like I said, an amazing group of people that help support making these these podcast episodes via their support on Patreon. So whether you want to make a one-time donation, a monthly donation, you can go to podcateers.com slash FGP for more information on how you can sign up and help support production of these episodes. To all of the members of the FGP squad, we just want to say thank you for your support. Check Patreon very soon because we have some stuff coming up for all of you. And yeah... It's a great time to be part of the FGP squad, especially going into 2020. I'm pretty excited. So, yeah. wee! <laughs> wee! Because it looks like that's where our videos are going to be, by the way. I know what? we've touched on this a couple times before, but it looks like our videos are going to be more private showings to the FGP squad going forward uh, just because of all the changes on YouTube. Uh, that might be the safest route for us to take. Until yeah. YouTube makes some changes. I haven't kept up with it. I've been very busy wrapping up some stuff, you know, with, with our family and everything. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it looks like in order for us to be as safe as possible, our videos may start becoming private for the FGP squad going forward. So mm-hmm. more info on that is coming soon. I like it. Hey, before we get into our topic, um, I, I thought of something that I wanted to bring up. Um, yeah. Are you guys playing Disney Collect by Tops yet? No. What is what? that? You guys, come on. Get on board. I need your help <laughs> in collecting some uh, digital collectible cards. Oh, I was going to say Tops. It sounds like baseball cards. Yeah. yeah. No, it's awesome. It's a Disney card collecting app. Um, it's been out for about three weeks now. Um, I am obsessed, and it's amazing. Uh, there, it is so playable without having to do any in-app purchases. There are, of course, the opportunity for in-app purchases, but you can have so much fun with this app without any of that. Um, there's like missions which you achieve that can give you huge bonuses. They give you free stuff all the time. It fulfills any sort of like collector itch that you might have inside, which I do. Um, it is awesome. So. If you guys get on, we can join up. You can trade with other collectors. So I can rain down upon you some amazing cards at this point because it's been out three weeks and I've got 2,862 cards already. Whoa. (laughs) And are those individuals or are they duplicates? (laughs) There's lots of duplicates in there. Yeah, there's that's not individual. Um, So far, there's probably about... I'd say 20 or so like what they do is they release like here's a new set and you try and collect that set you know it'll be like 12 cards and then there'll be like um, 12 special variant versions of those cards and so there's probably about 20 different sets and you know you kind of want to pick and choose which sets you want to go after to try and complete because there's no way you could complete them all. Um, but or that's where isn't the isn't there. Well, there might be. Yeah, if you spend the time, <laughs> I'm sure eventually you could collect them all. But, uh, but that's Just where the like trading Pokemon. comes in because like they'll expire yes. after a while, and once you you've bought as many cards as you can, if you haven't completed that set, then you can go to the trading portal and start trading with people to try and complete Ooh. your set. Every time you complete a set, there's like a reward card, which is like a special awesome card. Um, some of the cards are animated. Some of them are like super cool stylized artwork. Um, there's also like retro, um, I'm collecting a, a set right now called Disney Decades, which is all um, 
a, a piece of concept art from a major film from each decade of the company. Oh, that's uh, cool. Dude, it's awesome. There's stuff for everybody. They just released, um, a couple weeks ago, they released their Muppets Christmas set, which I completed. <gasps> it's awesome. <laughs> and then they just this week, they released a Phineas and Ferb set. They released a, what? a Gargoyles set, um, a Toy Story 4. Like, dude, there's so much. It's 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 just fun. And downloaded. <laughs> yeah, I just. I love the fact yeah. that black and white Mickey is the is on the cover sp- or the splash mm-hmm. screen. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's dude. Uh, if you like Disney stuff, it's just all kinds of fun. You know what I like the most about this? Hmm. So I'm launching the app and I'm going through its loading. Lock your cards to prevent trading. Awesome. So what I really like about this so far, from what you've explained, is that. Collecting things tends to take up a lot of space. Yeah. And, right? and, and remove or create space in your wallet. Right. Right. <laughs> it removes space from your wallet. Uh, or, yeah, create space, creates in, space your wallet. in your wallet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah, yeah. I said that backwards. <laughs> so it creates space in your wallet and takes up space in your house. Mm-hmm. And in most cases, uh, I don't know about you guys, but there's several things that I feel that I've collected over the years that – are just stored away. Yeah, like I'm not exactly. displaying them. There isn't a way for me to show them off either because I just don't want them out because I want to preserve them or because I don't want my children to say, Oh look, let me play with this and then open the package. <laughs> so I feel that a lot of that stuff is just collecting dust in a storage facility somewhere, mm-hmm. you know, because what else am I going to do with it? So this is, I, I wouldn't say fully the next generation of collecting because I think there's always going to be room for those collectibles that you have as tangibles in your home. Sure. But man, collecting cards as a kid was big for us. Oh, like yeah. We had garbage pail kids. We had yeah. baseball cards. We had Pokemon cards. My kids are big into the Pokemon cards right now. Mm-hmm. So I, I totally get this. And I love this. You know, I guess the space is only limited to what your phone can acquire and how many coins you can get during the day, according to what this loading screen says to me. Yep. Um, okay. I'm in. So <laughs> I just opened up one of my gifts and I'm like, Oh my gosh, these cards are cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, they've always got like free stuff in the store, like all the time. Uh, if they ever go down for maintenance, which they run every once in a while, they give you coins. Be like, sorry, we were down for two hours last night. And it's always in the middle of the night. It's like, I didn't care, but thanks for the 10,000 coins. <laughs> right. Uh, it's really <laughs> nice. cool. Um, there's news that hits every week. Um, and there's one f- uh, feature that they haven't released yet, which is the crafting feature, which apparently is going to be where you can, you know, kind of like wizard style, combine a bunch of cards and, and make them into a, a greater card. Um, <gasps> so that's exciting, too. Uh, that'll probably be the first of the year when that comes out. But. Man, it's just, it's really fun. This is cool. So you have to sign up and then friend people, right? Well, yeah, you can um, follow other users um, and, you know, that way you can um, connect with them more easily and trade with them. But you can trade with anybody. You don't have to, like, friend them or follow them or whatever to Oh, that's cool. Uh, trade. You basically just pick what you want to get, like what you need, and then you click find a partner and it searches and finds all people who have that card. And then you offer them a card in, in exchange, and they either accept or deny it. Oh, that's yeah. cool. It's really simple. Okay. Super simple. Okay. This is awesome. And I'm we in. can totally do this with our you know, our listeners. Oh, yeah. So I just signed up already. I have <laughs> an account and everything. Nice. I'm oh, signing up right this now. This is so cool. Okay. We'll share our usernames. Check the blog post for the episode, podcateers.com slash 287. We'll have our usernames on there. And... Uh, we'll start trading. I think it's yeah. a it's a cool collectible new toy for us to play with. I hope <laughs> you you've been playing now for three weeks. You said, uh, yeah, since right when it came out, and it hasn't become boring for you yet. No, okay, good. Because they're constantly releasing new uh, missions um, and new sets to collect with. Like the artwork for every single set is completely unique, so they all look very different. 
Um, my favorite so far is this Villains Electrified um, set, which is kind of Ooh. like the... Do you guys remember the Otterbox Villains cases that they released yeah. at D23 yeah. with like the 80s heavy metal look? They're like that, yes. but even like Ooh. more extreme. They're awesome. Um, so yeah, it, it has a ton of variety um, and it's a challenge. It's like a ongoing challenge to kind of get the sets that you want and, you know, find trading partners and, uh, yeah, it's, I, I haven't gotten bored of it at all. Nice. Okay. I'm in. Sweet. I'll send you guys a, uh, thing to, to friend me on there. I like it. Sweet. All right. <laughs> Okay, so let's jump into this week's topic. Uh, again, we're going to be talking about some of the updates to the Disneyland Resort, some of the events, D23, some of the most memorable things that we saw over the year. And we're going to start off with the Tropical Hideaway, which technically kind of opened at the end of December 2018. But, you know, the last couple weeks of the year, a lot of us are blocked out because uh, that's for the super duper annual pass mm -hmm. that most people don't have. Um, I, I think by the time that we experienced this, it was about a month or two in, right, of the opening. So, Mel, let's start with you. Uh, hmm. Thoughts on the Tropical Hideaway? Oh, I loved it. I, I loved what they brought, the new a uh, the area and um, the sounds and the little details and the food. Yeah, I can't complain. It, it's really good. I love it. Yeah, I mean, I think the key here is that Disneyland, at long last, has finally made the Dole Whip exceedingly accessible. Yes. Because <laughs> at the Tropical Hideaway, they added a new location for Dole Whip, which is much easier to get to than the... Uh, line at the Enchanted Tiki Room. And also, they added some flavors for us, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And you can swirl the flavors together, which is even more awesome. Right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's that. So to me, that's like the game changer thing that they did. But also, it was really cool for them to add a new location to Adventureland where you can sit, have a bite to eat, chill out, people watch. Like, that was such an underutilized corner of Adventureland, mm -hmm. of the park, really. And now it's hopping all the time. You know, it's yeah. like a place where right. things are happening. You get to see the Jungle Cruise uh, boats floating by. You get to hear Rosita saying things uh, while you sit there. So it kind of adds to the story of the Tiki, or explains the story of the Tiki Room a little bit further. Um and it, there's just a lot going on there. And it kind of helps create this idea of this like bustling, you know, marketplace in this jungle village and, you know, along this busy river port. And I, I think the theming is amazing. Uh, yeah. They knocked this one out of the park, like all the details, um, you know, all the references to the. The, there's that freaking society. I always forget the name the, of it every the time. The Society of Explorers and Adventurers. Thank you. The society of Explorers. The SEA. And, SEA. It's so easy. Yeah. But I, I forget it every time. They got references to them. They got beautiful like lighting fixtures and like everything about it. It's just perfection to me. They got the water feature out front. Ah, yeah. I could go on and on and on. <laughs> you, know, you know what the mnemonic device that I used for a long time to remember the SEA was? What? The C, the S E A, mm -hmm. originated at Tokyo Disney Sea. Ah, okay. Oh. And so the C is the Society of Adventures and Explorers. So Got it. it's not a great mnemonic device, but <laughs> it, it's kind of how I remembered it because the the whole deal was it was part of Mystic Point, and yeah. you know, I I think that's an episode on its own. Sure. Put a pin in that one. Okay. We should talk about yeah. the the S E A next year. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Those references, I think, were the best ones for me because Disneyland didn't really have a tie to that, and I loved the lore of the SEA. So the fact that there was references to all of that, that all the birds have perches outside, I think, was fantastic for mm -hmm. all the all the female birds that, that sing with Rosita mm -hmm. uh, was fantastic. And, yeah, I mean, the greatest thing, I think, about the Tropical Hideaway for me is that 
there's a there's sometimes additions to the park that don't feel organic. They just feel like they were placed there. The tropical hideaway doesn't seem like that at all. It seems right. like it's been there since the park yeah. opened. It's just integrated so beautifully into the ethos of what Adventureland is mm-hmm. that it's amazing and I love it. It's a fantastic place to sit. The ambiance is always fantastic and orange swirl do it for the win. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's hilarious you know that's someone i'm gonna go for so i prefer the raspberry <laughs> hey i know i know <laughs> it's okay look we're gonna agree to disagree on this one <laughs> we'll do an instagram poll which do you prefer raspberry Ooh. or orange okay. there you go i'd love Settle to it. see yeah I, I mean look i don't care which one wins right they're both delicious which yeah. one do I prefer? The orange one, because I just gravitate towards or orange flavored stuff. Mm-hmm. But now I want to see where our listeners kind of stand if they've had each of them. So, Mel, let's get an Instagram poll going for Raspberry Dole Whip versus Orange Dole Whip. And then Got let's it. see which one people like more. Heck yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let's move on. Uh, several months later, we had the next installment of Pixar Pier. Pixar Pier obviously was set to be in phases. The first part was kind of retheming most of the area from Paradise Pier to Pixar Pier. We had the Incredicoaster overlay happened on Screamin'. And in March, we had the opening of Jesse's Critter Carousel. And then in June, the Inside Out Emotional Whirlwind. Uh, Gavin, I think you were the first one to ride Jesse's Critter Carousel from all of us. Your thoughts? Um, that is almost accurate. I was the first one to get in line for this attraction, uh, no less than two times, and it broke down both times before I was able to That's get on. True. Uh, I don't yes. know if you remember, but That's the true. first three weeks, this very simple carousel would not work. <laughs> and is that when the grinding was happening? I, yeah. I don't know. That, that's when I wrote it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know what was going on with it, but uh, it seems simple. They. They've had merry-go-rounds for, you know, almost Forever. 200 years now. And, uh, yeah, I don't know why. But that being said, super cute. Um, the Jessie out front is amazing. She's such an adorable character. And then all her little critters are just stupid cute. Uh, there's <laughs> lots of hidden Mickeys, both on the uh, ride um, characters and on the mural that they created for it. So um, there's there's fun stuff to do and look for while you're in line. Um, I mean, I th- I think it's neat. I I don't really I th- I think how do I say this? I I, I wish they would have done something new instead of just retheming. You know, kind of like they did with Incredicoaster. It's like they didn't really give us two new attractions. They just put new you know, a new covering on both of these attractions. And I wish they would have done more new stuff with Pixar Pier, but what they did was, was pretty good. Um, I mean, the King Triton carousel never really fit with the kind of Victorian era boardwalk look they were going for either. So yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. Mel, tell us about the grinding on the carousel. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) Uh, after finally getting on, you know, everything's going smooth. And then all of a sudden we lift. I got worried. I'm like, is this me? What's going on? You just hear grind as you go up. And it's like you're coming down and goes up, grind. And it's like the same area. And I'm looking around like, is this normal? What's going on? Um, is it like it wasn't metal like a, grinding on metal? Is yeah. Okay. Like either it needed WD-40 or... I, I don't know, but it sounded weird. Like one, I don't think I've ever heard a awkward noise off of an attraction mm-hmm. that made me question, is this okay? Mm. Like that's, that would kind of, you know, startled me when I wrote it. Yeah. And that's why I was like, why am I looking around? Why do I feel <laughs> easy? When can I get off? <laughs> wow. But it's an, it's an adorable attraction, you know, just looking at everything but that moment was like, uh, uh yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, obviously, the Disney company was really trying to save as much money as possible yeah. because of the biggest overlay that we've seen in the park or the biggest expansion of the park that we've seen since its opening, which we're going to talk about shortly. So I, a lot of corners were cut. You know, as far as new attractions and, and just kind of retheming and slapping some new paint and some new stickers on a lot of what was originally Paradise Pier, now known as Pixar Pier. Um, you know, I think the, the Pal Around is one of those things where I, I think because it was all going to be Pixar, we all expected it to change to a giant Pixar ball, the Luxo lamp or something. Yeah. But having Mickey there... I understand, you know, Mickey's an icon. Mickey is what leads all of Disney. He's he's the leader of the club made for you and me. But it's Pixar Pier. Like, Disney doesn't, like, Mickey doesn't appear in the Pixar universe, which is why it's so odd that his face is still on the pal around. Well, <laughs> so my, my take on that, though, is that you only see Mickey from outside of Pixar Pier, really. You can kind of see him from some angles down by Lamplight, but... Um, when you're down in the pier area by the Ferris wheel, you can't see him, you know? So he's not showing really inside the land, you know? Yeah, I know. But if you want to really tell people like, hey, this is a Pixar area. Oh. Like, wouldn't you want to put like the Luxo ball or no, something? The, the theming is a mess, Hazen. It's it's not well conceived at all. I I, I feel like... It actually harkens back to DCA 1.0 in that someone wanted this idea real bad and they pushed it through and kind of did what they had to work with. And yeah. I, I, I think the color scheme of the pier is kind of pretty. I, I like that kind of those they're like... Um, grade primary tones you know um and i like that i think it's kind of pretty but trying to force like different neighborhoods like yeah. ride to ride to ride it's like a whole different pixar universe neighborhood like doesn't make any sense and i don't know i so the mickey thing is like uh, just more of a larger problem you know like yeah. it doesn't stand out to me because <clears throat> i think i think they could have been a lot smarter if they really wanted to retheme that, but I don't know. I've got yeah. problems with it. Yeah, I, I, it would have been a bigger undertaking, obviously, to put new attractions in there because they would have had to overhaul or just completely put up new buildings for stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that one of the major franchises of the Pixar universe, Monsters, Inc., is still in Hollywood land versus anywhere near Pixar Pier is yeah. still, you know, yeah. one of those issues. Uh, but I get what you're saying. Totally understand what you're saying. So let's talk about the other piece of completing Pixar Pier this year. And that was the Inside Out Emotional Whirlwind. The Inside Out Emotional Whirlwind was obviously a reskinning, a retheming, a Flix flying. What was it called? Flix, Flix flyers. flyers. Flix yeah. flyers from Bugs Land, which we lost this year as well for the expansion of the Marvel area, Avengers Campus, that's coming to California Adventure, which we'll touch on briefly. Um, so the Inside Out Emotional Whirlwind. What are your thoughts on this one? Because personally. I think this is one of the best reskinned items in Pixar Pier. Mm -hmm. At night, it is beautiful. I mean, you could take as many pictures and those colors come out so bright and vivid. Um, I think it's a lot of eye candy. I yeah. haven't written it, but I think it's beautifully done. It really is. I agree. It, it's a really pretty um, skin they put on it uh, with a, a really cool backdrop. Really captured all of those bright vibrant colors from the film mm -hmm. and yeah i mean I, I think they did a good job i think it's interesting I, i've looked pretty closely at it um in recent weeks uh and because of the super glossy kind of materials they decided to go with uh, it's already showing age you know it's already oh, no. showing some mm. like i don't know if it's sun damage or if it's just dust and pollution gathering and they're not they don't have an opportunity to clean it off enough but like 
the tops of everything are really dull uh, already, and that's a little disappointing. But other than that, I, I think it is really, really pretty. Yeah. <clears throat> so as far as we know, this completes the Pixar Pier overhaul, right? Those were the last two attractions that we were waiting for, or yeah. do we have anything else slated for that area? I think that's it, unless they were going to yeah. retheme the Paradise Gardens area as Pixar stuff too, but I don't think there's necessarily plans for that. Yeah, I haven't heard anything. I think that that does complete it, so... Yeah. I don't know about you. Like I said, I think the Inside Out Emotional Whirlwind is possibly the best reskinning of an attraction that's on there. But my favorite part of the entire Pixar Pier overlay now that it's complete has to be the entrance marquee. (laughs) (laughs) I think of everything that they added and everything that they changed. The marquee with the Luxo lamp is possibly my favorite part of it. Nice. Uh, What's your favorite part of Pixar Pier? Uh, downstairs lamp at Lamplight. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Oh, yes. Lamplight Lounge. <laughs> Lamplight Lounge is the best. Okay. That's the one true win of the entire yeah. thing is Lamplight Lounge. It's fantastic. Yeah. I think the fact that I've only been there a couple times and it hasn't been recent just mm-hmm. for some reason just took it out of mind for me. But uh, again, the, the Pixar Pier marquee for me hits on a lot of the Pixar levels, but it also fits on that pier slash carnival slash, you know, boardwalk esque mm-hmm. like aspect and feel. So I feel like that was the thing that took the most designing efforts. Sure. And they kind of nailed it. Uh plus, you know, it, it has the Pixar font and the Luxo lamp. It's just cute. Mm-hmm. You know, it is. So, but yes, <laughs> Lamplight Lounge, man, I agree. I dig what they did at Knickknacks as well. Um, I think that's a little better than what they did at Bing Bongs. I thought Bing Bongs was going to be like Candy Palace and it was going to be all like candy. And that would have been amazing. Yeah. Uh, It kind of stinks that it's actually not even half candy. Uh, But I think the other true win was... um, what is it, Jack Jack's Cookie Num Nums? That was genius. <laughs> oh, yes. Genius. The Num Num Cookies. Woo. Num Num Cookies. Oh, gosh, oh. they're so good. <laughs> Those with uh, with some milk, man. Mm-hmm. I know not everybody can do the milk, and not everybody likes their cookies with milk, but I'm a huge fan of milk and cookies. Totally. They do have um, uh, milk alter- alternatives, and they do have oh, they do, a yes. vegan version of the cookie itself. Yes, so. that is fantastic. I'm glad that they offer both of oh, those. Oh heck yeah, as and well. they're both delicious. So, yeah, I haven't had the vegan one. Mm-hmm. It's good. It's good too. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. Especially because um, vegan food is uh, it's different in trying to make it because some of the ingredients that are missing that tend to make things a little like cookies moist and make mm-hmm. sure that they don't crumble on you. Yeah. So if they nail that part of it, ah, uh, I'm actually going to try one. Yeah. I want to see what it's like now. So sweet. Yes. Oh no. I have to have a cookie. <laughs> oh jeez. It's for the it's podcast. It's for science. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, one of the other changes that came to the park came in April, and this was a direct response to someone at Imagineering listening to Podcateers and being like, you know what? That's a great idea. We totally need to do this. (laughs) And that was, we can't validate if that's true or not, but that was the reconstructing and reimagining of the facade slash entrance of Mickey's Philhar Magic. Yes. Um, I come on. There's enough evidence. They <laughs> they got that from us. Uh, yeah. So Philhar Magic came to DCA in April, and then it was like three or four months later that they actually moved the entrance and and reconstructed everything. Um, and I'm hoping that means that the attraction is getting more attention, more traffic, and might stick around longer than previous attractions in that location. I am so glad we finally got PhilharMagic here. I have been hearing about it for a long time. Uh, I believe it opened like 20-something years ago in in the Magic Kingdom. It still holds up because it is awesome. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. I am thrilled uh, every time I go watch it. I I just I think it's so delightful in, in the classic Disneyland attraction way. And it just fits so beautifully into that Hollywood land area. I love the marquee that they did right next to award wieners. Like it all just looks so great together to me. 
So yeah. uh, this Agreed. is this is a big thumbs up from me. Yep. And as you said, it's been around for 20 years. Like, I mean, not here, right. but for the 3D aspect for, of it to be very clear, and very good. Mm hmm. You guys heard us talk about it. It's awesome. Yeah. Yes. And you I'm know. still hearing people talk about it. <laughs> oh, my gosh, Hazen. <laughs> Dude, every time we've gone to DCA, there's always something else we end up doing. <laughs> Man, that needs to be your entire purpose of your next visit. Make that priority number one. It it's should. so good. So there is... Uh, there is a day this coming week that my wife and I are going to end up going to DCA because uh, we still have tabs left for Festival of Holidays. Mm, nice. And we're blocked out for the rest of the year after next weekend. Right. So we're going to try to uh, carve some time out to go. And on that trip, I should send her a text message right now so that I don't forget. <laughs> uh, I will send her a message so that we go watch Mickey's Magic finally Heck and yeah. make it something that happens in 2019 and hopefully on the same trip i'll finally see a raid at sleeping beauty castle so that i can hit <laughs> level 40 in pokemon go see i Cause... brought up <laughs> disney collect to get you off of the pokemon but that's not gonna happen <laughs> dude you know what i Look, know of all the things that I've played this year, Pokemon Go has been the most consistent because it just has such a large community. Yeah. It's so fun trading, playing with people. They're constantly adding features now, which has been fantastic. The only game that I've really dropped off was Wizards Unite because the features just were lacking when it launched and there was so much about it that was so frustrating to play when the technology was obviously there from Pokemon Go. They just had to port it and they decided not to. Mm. So I stopped playing. Maybe in the future I'll probably pick it up again once you know they add more of these features. But in the meantime... Now I have this new card collecting thing that I'm going to start doing. I play Pokemon Go very infrequently because I haven't wanted to hit level 40 outside of Disneyland. I know. That's just me personally. That's where <laughs> I want to hit level 40 in front of Sleeping Beauty Castle. And I'm hoping that it happens soon because if it doesn't happen this week, it's just going to have to happen somewhere else. Or it's going to have to happen without a raid. I'm just going to have to do some trades or something in mm -hmm. front of the castle so I can hit level 40 because I'm approximately 2,000 XP away now Jeez. from hitting... No, no, 10,000 XP from hitting level 40. So it's it's a simple raid. It's a few trades. It's catching a few Pokemon with an additional Stardust. I wanted it to be a raid because it's like the top tier thing that you can do mm -hmm. in the game right now. If it was fighting Giovanni, that would have been even better. <laughs> but that's not going to happen. Uh, Pokemon nerds are like, oh, yes, yes. Everybody else is like, why is he still talking? <laughs> um, <Yeah>. Gavin. <laughs> okay, so moving on. Uh, yes, I'm hoping to finally watch Mickey's Fall Heart Magic this week. And I will report back if Sweet. that happens next time that we record and or how I felt about watching it for the first time. I dig it. So, all right. Uh, okay, so the next thing that happened that was a kind of major refurbishment over at Disneyland proper was the plussing up of Sleeping Beauty Castle that happened in May, right in time for the opening of Galaxy's Edge. Uh, Sleeping Beauty Castle, the last time it received this type of overhaul was for the 60th anniversary when we had the Diamond Celebration for Disneyland. Uh, this was a little bit different because although it had some sparkly aspects to it, uh, Kim Irvine led the team of Imagineers and, and the group that really spruced up the castle in such a way that it made it pop in a way that I don't think I've ever seen it pop before. Yeah, she is beautiful. <laughs> uh, that's an understatement. It is magnificent. <laughs> yeah. I, whenever I see the castle now, I am the emoji with stars as eyes. Like <laughs> every single, it is, uh, I absolutely love what they did. Hats off to the Imagineering team that did that. It is so vibrant and beautifully colored. They did really smart things with color variation to make it uh, a, an optical illusion of, you know, even greater size. You know, they, yeah. they make it kind of fade into the atmosphere above so it looks like it's stretching even taller. That's an old painting trick and it's genius. 
They even did a lot of great things with the landscaping and areas around the castle, especially on the front side, which are absolutely beautiful. They've got the little um, turrets where they um, have lighting and projection uh, technology inside, but they look like these sweet little, you know, outer yard turrets for the castle. Um, to me, what it does is it... I always thought Fantasy Fair was a great extension of the castle courtyard and the castle itself, but now it is so much more fantastical that it just mm -hmm. it flows even better. And I don't know, to me, Fantasyland being the true heart of Disneyland, this castle now is just the perfect emblem for the gateway to fantasy and dreams. And I, I love it. Five stars. Yeah. I was going to say one of the coolest things is that it does pop because I remember, you know how like you would walk from the beginning of main street and you would see the castle. And there was a point where the castle was, the colors were so faded mm -hmm. that it kind of blended into the sky you know, the blues for me, like it would just blend too well. Yeah. Um, now you just see it. And even like up close, it's just all the details, everything. It doesn't just blend into the sky. Like you've got different blues finally. Mm -hmm. Like it's those little things that's just like, thank you. Yeah. You know, she needed yeah. this. The, she and, really needed this. And yeah, and it's you, she. Sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> and you fine. talked a little bit about this too, Gavin, that the way that it was painted um, because of the different color scheme uh, and it, it could just be an optical illusion because of the layering of it but there's a slight gradient fade mm -hmm. where from the bottom it just looks more saturated and darker yeah. and as the castle paint goes up it looks lighter and lighter to give the illusion that it's so much higher in the yes. sky yeah so what they're doing is it's, it's a it's a basic rendering technique where um, if you're if you're looking at a painting and it, it shows you depth like you're looking at a landscape and you can see way out into the distance the things in the foreground are going to be high contrast so the dark areas are going to be really dark and the light areas are going to be sharp highlights on that and then the further back you get it gets lighter toned you know toned towards the same colors as the sky and the atmosphere so it, it's less contrast in the castle the parts that are lower are closer to you and the parts that are taller are farther away. So they painted them with higher contrast at the bottom and then it's like a gradient. They get lower and lower contrast mm -hmm. as you go up and it just creates more of an illusion that it's taller than it really is. And you know, Sleeping Beauty Castle is the smallest of the castles. Um, it's, it's magnificent in every way, but it is small. And this just kind of gives it a little bit of a... It's like it's got inserts in its shoes now. It stands a little bit taller. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and it's such a subtle technique that it really enhances the visibility of the castle from even down on Main Street, mm -hmm. where on Main Street they use a lot of forced perspective. And it is used in the castle as well with the shortening of the turrets and just kind of squashing it from the top to give it that illusion. Yeah. But uh, aside from the forced perspective, the paint job that goes along with it pluses it up oh, 120 so oh, yeah. percent yeah those yeah. rich color those rich blues are just ah uh, eye candy yeah i know you know it's all very similar to what i talked about in the cars land episode with the uh, mountains the cadillac mountains and how they're mm -hmm. painted yeah. with atmospheric perspective so they look like they're much further back but they're literally right on top of the high contrasty rocks that are supposed to be more in the mid ground um right. it's just really smart you know, it, again, these are techniques that they use in film, like uh, matte paintings for film and, you know, a tradition in painting going back to the Renaissance. So it's yeah, it's just stuff that makes my little artist heart sing. Oh, <laughs> I love it. OK, so I think a lot of that was really what completed Project Stardust. 
I think the enhancements uh, to the walkways, which we didn't really talk about, actually. I know it came later in the year, but let's kind of jump to that because there was a couple of big enhancements that uh, happened to some of the signage and some of the openings to a couple of lands. Adventureland obviously changed the walkway. They changed the sign completely. And then recently, we lost the French Fry Rocks that were at the opening of Tomorrowland to mm -hmm. really open up that walkway. What do you guys think of those two enhancements, and how do you think they're really going to help the resort going forward? I finally got to see the open way for um, Tomorrowland, and I love it. I love how open it is, and just, I don't know if it's just me, but it just seems much more larger of an area. Because you don't have those rocks. You don't have that. To me, it was like an eyesore. So um, having a walk, I want to say at night, it seemed like a lot smoother. So, you know, hey, that works out. Adventureland, I'm all good. It's open too. You got elbow space. Finally, we've needed this. And the additions are cute. I mean, I really like the details in it. Yeah. I agree, and I, I think that along with the widening of the entrance in Adventureland, what they did with the uh, stroller parking area next to Jungle Cruise and yeah. um, oh, right. using yes. half of the Adventureland Bazaar as seating for Bengal Barbecue makes the, you know, basically almost intentional bottleneck of Adventureland go away. And th that, to me, made the biggest difference. The Tomorrowland one really just opened here in the last couple of weeks. And, you know, it, it seems much more open. Um, and I'm assuming the traffic patterns are going to bear that out. Uh, it'll be less congested right there. I think you still have the uh, bottleneck that's going to happen on the other side of the Astro Jets or whatever they're called. Astro Orbiter. Astro Orbiter, that's right. Uh, so I think you're still going to have a bottleneck on that side, but on the front side, mm -hmm. I think it's, it is nice and open and that'll help during parades and fireworks a lot. And I think that's part of what they're trying to do is reduce that congestion for those, um, things that happen every day. And I, for one, obviously am very happy about that because I'm always trying to get around those things and, yeah. you know, get to space mountain or pirates or something, uh, to take advantage of lower lines. So, yeah, I'm all for it. Pro tip. Yeah, I'm all for it. I, I think they've done a lot of other little subtle things around the park, you know, with moving benches, moving planter areas and things like that. But uh, I think they've all been pretty good. And leading into our next topic, which is on a totally different planet. Right. So... That leads us into Galaxy's Edge. Um, ironically, Project Stardust, what the what the enhancement project of the parks was called over the course of several years, uh, which, like Gavin said, move benches around, move trees around, open up walkways just to make the park more accessible because of the crowds that the Disneyland Resort was anticipating for the opening of Galaxy's Edge. Uh, ironically enough, I think it was Palpatine who had originally started creating the Death Star in Star Wars and the fact that we're opening a Star Wars area, the project that Palpatine dubbed, I believe, was also called Project Stardust in Star Wars. Oh, really? So <laughs> I don't know if that was on purpose <laughs> or hilarious. if it was just kind of like pixie dust, stardust type, you know, mm -hmm. pardon our pixie dust type verbiage that the Disneyland Resort was using. Either way... It perfectly fits. Galaxy's Edge opening up in May uh, during the soft opens, officially in June for the general public. We were expecting to see many of the things that had been announced at the D23 Expo a few years ago. A lot of that, unfortunately, did not make it into Batu, but we did get Smuggler's Run and Oga's Cantina, the ability to go to Savi's workshop and create lightsabers. Overall, what are your thoughts on Galaxy's Edge, um, first when it opened and now looking back on it six months later? I think that the, on a theming level, it is amazing. It, it's really, really astoundingly good. I, I have my criticisms of choices they made. Uh, I think it was a huge risk to create a, a land that's a location not seen in any of the films. 
you know, the, the fact that the only familiar thing in the land really is the Millennium Falcon. You know, they have a version of a TIE fighter and a version of an X-Wing and, you know, types of ships we see, but not an actual ship from the films except for the Millennium Falcon. I think that was a big risk, and I think it is kind of bared out by the fact that the crowd levels are less. I think if this was, you know, Mos Eisley and they had the actual cantina from the film, uh, I think if this was, you know, Endor and you had like an Ewok village and, you know, stuff like that, or even Hoth, you know, something from the film uh, world of Star Wars, like Cars Land, even like Avatar, you know, it, it's very much straight from the film, you know, those locations that we saw. This, you don't see anything from the film. So to me, I think that's a problem. But what they created is absolutely fantastic. As an attractions guy, I don't find myself going back there all the time because there, right now there's only one attraction. Hopefully, it will be like New Orleans Square very soon and have two e-ticket attractions that keep us coming back time and time again. Um, you know, jury is still out. Um, I'm sure any of our Disney World friends can uh, uh, that have experienced it can let us know how that is. Although we don't want spoilers yet, we we want to experience it for ourselves. Right. But right now, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like I've explored it. If you don't want to spend one to two hundred dollars on either a droid or a lightsaber. Like those experiences aren't really like something you can go in and see without actually paying for really. Yeah. And you know, that's kind of too bad. Um, so really like if you've gone to the cantina and you've done smugglers run 150 times like me, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, you know, at this point I just am kind of waiting for that next attraction and, and we'll see how much this is, a. Uh, land that keeps us coming back I, I think right now there's there's a bit of a waiting game Mel what about you where do you kind of stand on it I, I actually gosh I really love what they've done um, atmosphere wise I I'm going to miss the area next to rise of the resistance because it's so nice and quiet mm -hmm. and I get to hear mm -hmm. everything that still to this day really just take me somewhere else um from having to be in line waiting to get in there for the first time you have like that that sense that you're out somewhere else mm -hmm. and i still get that um even to today just the little areas the little things that's me um there's been times where I've walked around and it's like smugglers run 20 minutes. I'm going to go sit over here <laughs> and yeah. listen to everything else. I'm, I'm that weirdo that does that. Um, but you know what? To be honest, I haven't bought anything from Galaxy's Edge. I've only bought. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm laughing. but I've only bought the reusable totes. <laughs> That's uh, it. Yeah, we have several of those. Yeah, I, I haven't bought anything. I mean, I just I don't have that urge to, you know, one day I'll get a lightsaber for sure. I just don't see myself getting it right now. But um, everything else, people watching, watching Vi walk around, watching Ray, uh, Chewie, I mean, just everyone. I mean, to me, I'd rather just do that. Um I think it gives me something else. I just, I really enjoy it. I'm just savoring these last <laughs> few weeks before the next crowd. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how chaotic it becomes uh, in Galaxy's Edge once the opening of Rise of the Resistance happens in January yeah. here in Anaheim. Overall, I have to agree with you, the theming in general and what they did to give you an opportunity to step out of Disneyland into this brand new planet, mm -hmm. you know, is absolutely gorgeous. The rock work is amazing. The theming is fantastic. 
Um, from the side of the Rivers of America, it has one of the most brilliantly themed organic walkways that leads yeah. you from Disneyland proper into mm -hmm. this other planet. Yeah. And the way that they do it with the trees and the sounds changing the further that you get in is absolutely brilliant. I, I love how they executed that. Uh, I can't say the same for the exit slash entrance that's behind Frontierland, um, but obviously they had less space to execute it on that side of the park, so you can't really fault them for that. It's, it is a much smaller area. Um, when you think about what they did, like you talked a little bit about this, Gavin, where it was a risk for them to send us to a planet that nobody's ever seen before. You know, I've heard Imagineers talk about, and I think I'm going to get the term wrong, but um, designing for guest zero instead of guest one or guest two or guest 20. They're designing for the people that are seeing it for the first time and are seeing it for the first time in the future, essentially. Mm. And so I think by giving us a planet that doesn't exist in the Star Wars universe right now, they, they're trying to future-proof themselves for the next 50 years, if possible. Because it was such a large investment that now Batu is going to become a larger part of the Star Wars universe now that we're wrapping up the first nine episodes of what was George Lucas's original story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're going to see more, like Kylo's already a part of it, Ray's already a part of it, we see Chewie walking around, Vi was just a part of the graphic novel side of it, and now it's kind of transitioning into uh, a bigger part of the land. So I think... Because they're trying to create their version of the Star Wars universe to future-proof it for the people watching it now, I think it's only a matter of time before we see Mando walking around Batuu. That's, that's possible, you know? yeah. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things where there's going to be more synergy. It's just not there yet because Star Wars fans wanted to walk onto Hoth. They wanted to walk into Endor. They wanted to walk into Mose Eisley's cantina, not Oga's cantina. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think when you think about how they're preparing us for the next nine episodes of whatever the Star Wars story is going to tell us, this is now going to be a huge part of that next chapter in Star Wars. It doesn't necessarily give you an outlet for what came before, which in some senses may have been a mistake for the hardcore Star Wars fans now, but I don't think Disney was necessarily worried about that. They were necessarily worried about how are they going to future-proof this for the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I could be wrong, but that's kind of the way that I interpreted them bringing another planet uh, into Disneyland and into the Star Wars universe. Um, okay, yeah, I, I also have not purchased anything outside of food. Um, I think what people, I don't know if this has changed since the opening, but I don't think people realized that making an appointment to go into Savi's workshop or um, I don't think it's the case for the Droid Depot. You can just walk through there. But if you made an appointment for Savi's workshop, you were essentially committing to buying that $200 lightsaber. Mm. That was part of oh, the yeah. deal. So I don't know if that's changed yet. It might still be the same because creating the lightsaber is just such an experience and people like sit in there and they cry at times because of the ceremony and everything that happens when you select your kyber crystal and stuff. Uh, so yeah, I, I think there, there should be more of those experiences. The fact that this is the first land that really integrates the play app is fantastic. The play app I think yeah, has a true. lot of uh, of features that are kind of yet to be desired and it's missing a lot of things that seem common sense when building something like this but I, this is their first real run at doing something like this for an entire land and if it gets to the point where these intergalactic credits that you're hacking things around the land for and every time you ride the falcon you collect these additional credits 
if they can somehow convert that into real world currency where you can trade one in for a blue milk or something dude that just adds so much to the to the legacy of the land because now you're using the currency of the land yeah right now the closest you can get to that is buying that hundred dollar gift card that looks like a, a metal credit that you carry around and um, it's very easy to spend a hundred dollars at Galaxy's Edge. Uh, I still personally think that if you plan on being there or going back a few times, it's worth having the collectible. Especially even if you're visiting, you're going to spend a hundred dollars of food if you're on vacation or something. So it's worth getting it as a collectible and then using it as a gift card throughout the park yeah. because that's essentially what it is. It's just uh, a very fancy gift card. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if they made some enhancements to the app uh made you uh, allowed you to convert it to real world currency and they just brought back some of the features that you know could be easy to implement we've talked about having like wally go around tomorrowland the droids that were supposed to go around on the floor rolling around in galaxy's edge that are not there now they could easily add some of that behind the mountains you know those are conveyor belts that they can somehow add and i think it would add to that kinetic energy that we always talk about having around in the lands Mm -hmm. that just bring uh, a a more cohesiveness and make it look like there's more happening than people just walking around uh, in the in the area itself so yeah it's going to be interesting to see what rise of the resistance does to it I, i don't think it's made a huge deal yet at walt disney world before we move on to the next topic let me ask you this how do you feel about the fact that they essentially created a carbon copy of Galaxy's Edge at Walt Disney World? I think That's I don't think fine. it was. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's um, a problem necessarily. No. I do think that is another contributing factor to why crowds were less than expected at Disneyland because everybody east of the Rockies was waiting for their home park to get it, which is Disney World, and. You know, so th- that affected that level of it. But I mean, I do think it it's kind of I don't want to say shooting themselves in the foot, but neither of them has that signature Star Wars thing anymore. They both have mm-hmm. the same offerings. So, uh, you know, I I don't know. I, I think they were banking on the fact that Star Wars is universal and everybody's going to, you know, love it no matter what. And I think in some ways that's true, but I don't know. I I think the the real differentiating point happens when that hotel opens, which I think is in two years or something. Um, Then Disney World will have the signature Star Wars experience that will be, you know, best, so to speak. Right. Uh, Right. So until then, though, it's, you know, they're playing with the same cards, same deck. Yeah. yeah, I mean, considering I think it's Hong Kong that's a carbon copy of Disneyland. I mean, kind of. ish, like, yeah. In, in, in yeah, most it's, regards, I mean, I think it yeah. helps with demand. Um, maybe some people can't travel that's, you know, as far as Anaheim, and you know, give them that experience. Why not? You know, it's all good. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Okay. Um, So let's move on to one of the biggest things uh, that we celebrated in 2019 at the Disneyland Resort, and that was the 50th anniversary of the Haunted Mansion. Uh, This was a big deal for a lot of us being such mansion fans, and the Haunted Mansion lore, I think has just grown exponentially. Uh, We saw this when we started up hashtag hatbox ghost day with the return of the hatbox ghost during the 60th anniversary celebration now we we celebrated the 50th anniversary unfortunately we didn't see a lot of plussing of the mansion uh this last week it was announced that when the mansion goes down for the uh nightmare before christmas overlay uh for for it to be removed that there are going to be some enhancements to some of the mechanics and there's going to be some plussing inside of the mansion. I still don't think it's going to be a huge surprise like we got with the Hatbox Ghost going into 2020. 
But Gavin, of the three of us, you were the one that had an opportunity to go to the special Haunted Mansion 50th anniversary event. Uh, can you quickly recap that and then your thoughts on the celebration in general? Sure. Um, side note first, though, when it comes back up and the Candleman's in there, you're going to eat your words. And I'll be happy to do <laughs> I know, that if I know. the Candleman is in there. I, I, think, I think we got to have him, man. Just bring him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the 50th anniversary party, which was called Celebrating 50 Years of Retirement Unliving, which is a totally ridiculous name. Uh, I did not like the way they called it, but... Um, yeah, so it was like a day-long thing um, during the entire day. It was an event at the Disneyland Hotel, which included a, an exclusive shopping experience of artwork and Mansion 50th uh, merchandise, uh, some of which was exclusive, but most of which was available in the park the next day. Um, so slight disappointment there. But there was also the chance to buy brand new 50th anniversary art by Disney artists and get it signed by those artists. So I definitely jumped on that chance to get the uh, new Jeremy Fulton piece. And I got to ch uh, chat with him for a bit. And that was an absolute thrill for me. Um, and then I also got to visit with our friend Jared Mariama while I was there. And that was also awesome. Um, so that was basic. Oh, they also had an area at the hotel um, filled with photo ops. Um, so lots of um, places um, set up to take photographs, uh, a, a facade of the mansion, which was really, really detailed and cool. Lots of artwork backdrops. You can get a, a picture in front of a replica of the casket with the guy trying to lift the lid off, things like that. It, it was pretty cool. And then it was there that you got the party uh, gift, which was this amazing Madame Leota paperweight, which I have on my desk, which is Whoop. super, super cool. I love it. It looks cool, yeah. I will say, I, sorry to cut oh, you off, fine. but I will say that I felt that it was a lost opportunity to not give you some kind of stand so that if you didn't want to use it as a paperweight, you could sit it on the stand and have her looking at you yeah. the way that she's sitting on the table. Yeah, I hear that. Uh, so then the second half of the party was to be held at Disneyland after closing uh, the entire left hand side of the park. So Adventureland, Frontierland, New Orleans Square and Critter Country were all open during this party. All attractions and restaurants were open. And they had special entertainment, including a big show on the Fantasmic stage to open it. Uh, the Cadaver Dance performed from the balcony of the Dream Suite. And there were other processions uh, and things that happened throughout the night. Uh, part of the party ticket was um, food festival style food tabs for special event uh, food offerings, of which we got to partake in five, I think. We had a couple tabs left, uh, which was disappointing to us that we didn't get to spend them all. Uh, and then, of course, the big thrill for a lot of people, besides the additional photo ops with mansion characters during the party, was the mansion itself, which they lit in this incredible way. They just had the thing glowing, basically, uh, with spooky green and purple and blue lights. It was awesome. Um, but on the attraction itself, they gave us some surprises in the form of live cast members um, partaking in the various scenes, um, getting in on the, um, the scare factor uh, along the way. And that was really awesome. Um, and then the other thing they did was they um, had a spooky soundtrack playing throughout the park with organ music and harpsichord music and just a general creepy vibe. And then uh, the lighting throughout the park included lightning strikes and fog and uh, the whole atmosphere was done really, really well. So that is the nutshell version of the uh, anniversary party everything sounded great you know having the photo ops watching all the ceremonies the 13th hour opening celebration mm -hmm. to kick off the entire event uh, i had a chance to watch that uh, on youtube i know that you were writing indiana jones i believe at the time uh big thunder uh, or, but oh, yeah big thunder, sorry yeah it's one of those things where 
going into it, you don't really know how it's all going to play out. And right. like, if we could have gone back, we could have had a game plan, but there's no way to game plan for it. Right. And, and I think these events uh, are really difficult to plan for because I, I think we fall into this category where when we go to these types of events, we want to enjoy it, mm-hmm. but we also want to try to do as much as possible to try to report back, right? And there's this crazy balance that you have to strike so that you do get to enjoy what you're attending versus only working, which at times has felt like. You know, there's times where we go to the park to do a couple of things, and if we're recording video and we're vlogging, like, it just feels like that's all that we're doing. Mm-hmm. We don't get to enjoy the park because we're done and then we're gone. So the fact that we don't frequent the park every day or every other day like a lot of other people do uh, really does put a damper in how much we can do sometimes when we get an opportunity to go. Yeah. So with that said, uh, I think one of the coolest things that was part of the event was obviously the addition of the live cast members inside of the mansion yeah. for this celebration. The night, obviously, was one of the biggest surprises as you're hitting the endless hallway. The night that's standing there originally was a cast member when the mansion first opened. It would scare people and jump around until somebody decided to punch it and hurt it, <laughs> and they just kind of did away with with that uh you would figure that the armor would have protected them a little bit but <laughs> i mean who knows so i i can see them adding something like that in this plussing of the mansion right mm-hmm. that seems if we don't get the candleman for instance i could see them building an animatronic night which doesn't have to be as fluid as some of the other animatronics that we see around in the park because it is a night it is carrying all of this armor it does have significant weight so it will look more weighty and jagged in its movements but just kind of like moving and kind of moving the staff forward or kind of like putting its arms up and in a boo type motion or something that i can see happening Uh, I think it would be a welcomed enhancement to the mansion because we haven't seen much of that uh, since the Hatbox Ghost. And before the Hatbox Ghost, uh, I think the last enhancements that we saw were uh, the addition of Madame Leota's ball floating around in the seance room as opposed to being in the same location when the projection technology got a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, overall... For me, not even having gone to the event, that seems like the most memorable part of it. (laughs) But, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this in the last episode with some of the Disney After Dark events. Those events tend to be about $100. This one was a lot more expensive. You know, I I don't know how other people feel about it, but it seems that you got just about the same amount of stuff that you would have gotten from a hundred dollar event versus this three hundred dollar event. Am I am I accurate in saying that? Yeah, you're pretty accurate. Um, You know, the there were a couple things that um, that we really found kind of disappointing. You know, the the real draw for us was this chance to have a night in the park after the it was closed to the public to a limited group of people and have you know free reign of this whole half of the park well um when it was originally described the actual timeline wasn't the same as what ended up being the case so we only ended up being in the park um, from 1 a.m till 4 a.m so it was only a three hour window which is not a long time when you're trying to use food tabs, when you're trying to see special events, when you're trying to ride attractions, like that's not a lot of time, you know, even with a limited amount of people, um, it went by really, really fast. Uh, So I don't know how long the Disney After Dark things last. None of us have actually done one, but I always get the impression that they were a little bit longer. I don't know if that's true or not, but this seemed really short. And it seemed like it was more about the chance to shop the 50th anniversary shop at the hotel during the day before anybody else got the chance to shop for that merchandise the next day. And I don't care about getting something first or, you know, like I'm not all about exclusive merchandise. I thought it would be neat to get something cool for the mansion's 50th anniversary. 
Um, but the fact that it was all on sale the next day, basically, like, uh, like why did I pay three hundred dollars for that? You know, like I don't know. Yeah, it was. Uh, it it kind of left a bit of a bad taste in our mouth. We did have fun. Uh, I just don't know if we had the type of fun that justified the ticket price. That's completely understood too. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the the after dark events, from what I recall they start letting you into the park uh, depending on the event somewhere between 4 and 6 p.m. Yeah, it's like the Halloween and they party. tend to run yeah and they tend to run until midnight or 1 1 a.m. and usually around the 7 or 8 p.m. mark is when they start ushering out yeah. the guests that don't have the wristband for the special event see for so, this one we had to start lining up in the esplanade at 11 p.m. so we were in the esplanade for two hours just in a line waiting oh, wow. to go in and then they finally let us in um at 1 a.m and you know so it was like it was it was very different than all the other events that i've known and and heard about because there was so much to experience and there wasn't really uh any guidance do you feel that it would have been better or worse if they they kind of led you all like in a line and said okay we're going here first this is the first part of the show we're going to lead you over here this is the next part and then they kind of did all the showy stuff first and then they kind of repeated it throughout the night so you can go get on the attractions eat your food whatever the case was or you know the way that it was kind of just go do whatever you want yeah at, at your leisure like which would you have preferred they they should have done that 13th hour show once an hour they they should have given us another chance to see it because even if we wanted to like there was enough people there that a lot of people didn't have a good view of it you know mm. like you know where it was like well this is kind of not good uh so i wish they would have given us more chances to see that for sure i think that would have been better um I don't know. I think I, I think if we did it again, we would approach it very differently. You know, I think we would have focused on different things. But to us being attraction people, like part of the draw was that it was this, you know, small group of people in the park and everything was a walk on. You know, they let us stay in the Jeep on Indy for three rides. Like that's how, you know, deserted it was. And that's kind of a magical thing. But not not worth it right (laughs) right that's what i keep coming back to is it 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 wasn't really worth it completely understandable okay so let's move on uh the last major thing that we had going on in 2019 was the d23 expo Uh, i had a chance to go a couple of the days Um, there was a couple things that i didn't get a chance to see that saturday that i think even you had planned and ultimately didn't get a chance to to check out because of uh, technical difficulties in lines and all that sort of stuff during the event. Let's talk a little bit about our experience at the D23 Expo. Mel, uh, mm-hmm. let's start with you. Overall, better expo than before? Uh, was there a lot to be desired as far as how it was maintained and how the staff there that was working kind of guided people around? Or what do you think? I got to do a lot more this time around. Um, My only downfall, unfortunately, is the Haunted Mansion panel. That is, I think, when I've never experienced anything um, chaotic, if that makes sense. I mean, it was just the way that we were treated, the way we were spoken to. kind of like in demands it's like hold on we don't even get this treatment at disneyland why are we being shouted at why are we being pushed around telling us this and that or that we're not going to be able to get you know our family gold membership we're not going to be validated it's like whoa this that was that was hurtful that was hard it was it, that was just chaotic just from my experience <laughs> um very good panel unfortunately the beginning part of it and let's just say a little bit more kind of got me like uh i why did i even do this why did i waste my time on this particular panel 
that I was really dying to go into and whatnot. And it's just like, eh. But everything else was magical. I mean, I got my first signed vinyl. I got to meet Anthony Gonzalez. I got to see panels that I wanted to see, like The Voices, Broadway. I mean, this was a whole, put it this way. Besides that mess, everything was awesome. Even seeing friends, meeting friends, seeing awesome costumes, cosplayers. I mean, I had a blast overall. Tiring, yeah. but a blast. Right on. Kevin, what about you? Yeah, uh, so I don't go to a lot of large cons, but uh, the D23 Expo is a con that I've been to um, every time except for the very first one. So this was, what, my sixth one, I think, seventh one. Um, I've got a lot of experience with it, and I went all three days this weekend. And I think this year, uh, re... Um, how do I say it? This year brought forth again a concept which I try and communicate to everyone I talk to who's going to the expo, and that is to manage your expectations. Do not go there believing for one second that you will get to see every panel you want to see, that you will get to experience everything you want to experience. Pick your one or two priorities and make those happen. Everything else is an amazing bonus. And if you can yes. approach it that way and, you know, roll with the punches, which you have to do at these expos, then you'll have a great time. Now, we all had some moments like Melissa's there and there was a couple others. Uh, most of the moments were due to the fact that they completely changed the game again on getting into panels uh, where they had they had kind of dialed in this stage pass system over the last four three expos that most of us had gotten used to. It made sense. We all um, participated in it and it was like getting a fast pass at the park. It was the same thing. Well, this year they changed the game and now they did them online and now they added another line on top of that for gold members. And then there's a general admission and sometimes you got caught in between. And by the time you got denied for one, you were already denied for the other and the general admission one's full too. So there was some logistics problems, you know, but mm -hmm. that being said, like every other expo I've been to, I saw incredible panels. You know, I think the biggest highlight for me was the Disney on Broadway 25th anniversary panel, which was like a concert for the ages. It was amazing. I loved the sights and sounds of Galaxy's Edge panel that I went to. Um, and... You know, I thought the show floor had tons and tons and tons of fun, things to explore and experience. Um, I had a wonderful time, you know, as I do every time. But I learned from the very first expo, <laughs> you just got to manage your expectations. You know, yeah. <laughs> I came away with some great souvenirs. You know, my my phone case is my favorite thing that I got, this cool Scar 80s heavy metal Otterbox phone case, which I love. Um, and, you know, it was it was cool. I, I had a great time. Uh, I think they always tend to learn from Expo to Expo. So I think with this new reservation and line management thing, they'll learn from that and it'll get better next year. They'll add or subtract things or figure out better ways to do it. So, yeah, that, that's the long and short of, of my thoughts on this year's expo. Yeah, I have to agree with you that the online reservation system that they used this year, uh, I think I, I feel like in a lot of ways it was much easier, especially because you didn't have to waste time at the expo trying to stand in a line for stage pass and trying to figure out what you wanted. So the mm -hmm. fact that you were able to do that in advance felt like there was a much better flow to the entire expo because there wasn't these huge lines waiting for stage pass. And that's been one of the most disappointing aspects for me that I spent all this money to go to the expo and I know that I have to stand in lines and queues to to go into the panels, but to also stand in a line for a stage pass prior to standing in a line for the thing I want to watch was kind of ridiculous. So the fact that they've integrated this online queue system that, like you said, is only going to get better the more that they use it 
really does speak to the fact that they're listening to people's complaints and what disappointed people over the course of the last several expos to try to make that experience a little bit better for everybody because you did have the opportunity to experience a lot more not having to wait in a 12-hour line for the Disney Legends ceremony was huge for me because I got to sleep a lot more and I had the opportunity to go see more of the floor this time around because I didn't have to go stand in another standby line for the next thing that I wanted to watch because I already had this stage pass preset in the reservation system. Um, there was a lot of glitches, obviously, with how the system worked, especially if you had guests on your pass, if you had um, separate day passes that weren't necessarily all linked together. Uh, the fact that they integrated RFID into the passes, I think, was a really great step forward. We've already seen a lot of that technology with magic bands and a lot of other things that they use at Disneyland uh, parks around the world, especially Walt Disney World. The magic bands are huge. So integrating that type of technology in order to check people in and they kind of already know your name, they know what you're going to watch, they can cater your experience a little bit more. And this... Uh, this integration into the D23 Expo, I think, is only going to be more enhanced at the next one because the next step might obviously be where instead of just scanning your badge to send you emails or collect a Hulu pin or something, it's going to trigger certain experiences you know, with, with animated characters or animate a booth for you and it kind of just knows your name or it personalizes a photo op for you because it knows your name or, I mean, who knows? The possibilities are endless when you start integrating this technology, right? But this was a really good way of, of kind of dipping their toes into that pool. This expo, I really think, was heavy on really hammering down that Disney Plus was coming. Mm -hmm. Every corner that you that you turned, it, there was some kind of Disney Plus uh, aspect to what was happening. Avengers Campus uh, had a large showing, but didn't feel like it was as large as the Disney Plus showing that was happening on center main stage mm -hmm. uh, at the expo itself. Um, and then, of course, obviously, all the panels that we had a chance to attend. Uh, I attended not many panels. Uh, I attended the art of storytelling. Uh, I attended um, the what was the other one that I had a chance to attend? Oh, the legend ceremony. And then the parks and resorts panel that I attended uh, with Lynette. It's always interesting to see some of those here's what's coming up panels mm -hmm. because it's always interesting to see what they announce and what ends up making it into the park in the final product. We've seen a lot of that with like uh, Galaxy's Edge. We've seen it with other areas. We've seen things omitted you know, in the, in the past due to budgetary restraints or, you know, they run out of time, whatever the case is. Um, so I'm interested to see what we end up getting on Avengers Campus here at California Adventure and how it will differ from what was presented at the D23 Expo. Obviously, the Parks and Resort panel was two plus hours of this giant Disney commercial of here's what's coming to the parks around the world. Magic Happens, I think, is one of the things that I'm most uh, excited about coming to the resort. I know you're not big on parades, Gavin. You're your let's go to an attraction, but the floats in this one just look really fantastic. I think it's time that we have a new parade coming down Main Street at the Disneyland Resort, and I'm still pushing for the fact that even though it's not new, it's new to us, we need to get dream lights at night, you know, just so that we have something new. But Magic Happens During the Day is already gearing up to be a really fantastic show, so... Uh, yeah, I think those are some of the highlights for me and some of the downsides to this expo. But I, I really do feel that by the next one, some of the issues that they experience with the virtual queue system in trying to get some of those panels will be hopefully you know, ironed out a little bit more. And they will have learned from this experience. Just make it a better one next time around. Speaking of next time around, Hazen... You should already <laughs> already be preparing oh, I for already early am. bird tickets, which happen in yeah, August, because we need you there on Saturday. Yep. yep. Already planning for it. 
<laughs> you better be. There's two expos in a row, man. I know. I know. I'm disappointed <laughs> in myself. So I'm planning for it this time. <laughs> Next August, I'm going to get on that early bird special, and I'm going to get all three days, Good. and and we're going to do this. We're going to podcateer it up Good. for three days at the D23 Expo in 2021. Nice. All right. Uh, I think that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Uh, there was a lot of really great additions to the Disneyland Resort, California Adventure, and, and you know, some at Walt Disney World that we didn't touch on completely. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of changes coming to Walt Disney World over the course of the next several years with a lot of the things that were announced at the Expo that I think we're going to be touching on over the course of 2020. But as far as 2019 is concerned, uh, join the conversation and let us know what some of your favorite additions to the park were. What's the most memorable? What did you hate the most? Obviously, there were a lot of times during Project Stardust that were inconvenient, you know, at times. And as an annual pass holder, I think that was uh, a difficult time because there were days that you would go and things would be shut down. Walkways wouldn't be accessible. And the price just kind of kept going up yeah. <laughs> in the meantime. So I think as a as an annual pass holder, that was possibly one of the most frustrating things. Now that all those additions have been made, there's less walls up. How do you feel about those additions? You know, join the conversation over on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or even the blog post for this episode at podcateers.com slash 287. You can search for podcateers on any of the social networks. We're available on any of those. And share your thoughts we'll share those in an upcoming episode uh, and also as i mentioned at the top of the podcast again we're starting to create our calendar of topics for 2020 so if there's anything that you would like to suggest that we talk about in 2020 again leave us a comment on any social network instagram facebook twitter or the blog post tell us what you want to hear like we said, you know, we do this podcast because we love it. We love Disney history. We love talking about our thoughts on things that change upcoming or things that aren't in the park anymore. But we do this as much for us as we do, you know, for you. You know, you're you're what gears the podcast. And so we want to make sure that we're talking about things that you want to hear about as well. So leave a comment. Tell us what you want to hear about. And we'll try to incorporate it into our upcoming schedule. Uh, as a footnote, there are... Um three other wins that the resort had uh, this year that are outside the park, but inside the resort. Uh, Black Tap, Ballast Point, both awesome. Absolutely. And Pixar Pals parking structure, total win. Oh, yeah. We didn't even yeah. touch on that. Yeah. And I feel like that's really big for the resort. Sure. It really yeah. is. I it did is. not think of it until about five minutes ago. Uh, so I and wanted you know to throw what? it in it as a footnote. <laughs> Yeah, definitely not a footnote. <laughs> I, I know it's being inserted as, but it's been such a game changer to not receive tweets from the Disneyland Resort every two hours saying that Mickey and Friends is officially closed because there's mm -hmm. no right? more room in there. Uh, it's fantastic. I think they did a really great job with the theming and the structure itself. Uh, the new loading area, I think, oh, has huge. been an absolute win. And it's such an improvement over the way that it was before, even with the incorporation of all of the metal detectors for safety purposes. Mm -hmm. So, yes, absolutely. Pixar Pals, such a win for the resort this year. All right. That's going to wrap it up for this episode. Again, Tell us what you really enjoyed uh, about what was added to the resort. And if there was anything that you would have changed, you know, tell us what you would have changed or what you would have excluded. So that's it. It's time to head to Disneyland, hopefully watch Mickey's Phil Hard Magic for the very first time. So until next time, keep dreaming, keep moving forward, and always remember to pass on the magic. Have a great week, everyone. Bye. Made you look.